Hi, I'm John Andrus, the Bill T. Jones Director and Curator of Performing Arts here at the ICA. And I'm so privileged to be joined by Kyle Abraham, choreographer extraordinaire and artistic director of AIM by Kyle Abraham. The company will be performing at the ICA April 15th through 17th. And Kyle is joining me today to provide a little bit of context and insight into the performances that his company will present here at the museum. So thank you so much for joining me, Kyle. Yes, thanks for having me today. I guess first, it's been just an extraordinary privilege here in Boston at the ICA to once again present live performance. Um, our audiences have been so thrilled to return and see artists performing and enlivening our stages again. And I also know that you and your company have been touring and performing quite a bit as well. And so I just wanted to find out from you, what's that experience been like this return and for members of your company? Change with coming back to touring is um, trying to follow all the COVID protocols and you know not hug people and all that kind of stuff. And it's really challenging when you go to places that you have a familiarity with, you have family uh, and all these things and you want to be able to have that exchange, but you want the the work to actually make its way to stage and to the point we can bow at the end of the performance <laughs> uh, with everyone testing negative um, for COVID. So it is challenging and it's, there's always that little bit of bittersweetness to it, but it is such a beautiful thing to be able to share work again in front of audiences. And, and I think, you know, one of my big worries was that um, people wouldn't be able to feel really present or like have that little bit of like, both uh, escapism and alternate reality uh, that I think performance can kind of take people to in, some time, in a lot of cases. And I, and I found that to be um, one of those things that like actually people can kind of be really focused and, and really um, immersed in, in live performance again, which is really lovely, even with the masks on. I found that to be true as well. Um, it's just, it's an extraordinary pleasure just to be back in in a darkened theater um, and see all of these amazing performances. Um, one of the things that first attracted me to your work when I saw it for the first time many years ago was the, the relationship to your choreography with the music that you choose. It feels like it's a very personal choice on your part, the selections of music. I mean, in the pieces that I know of yours, the selections vary so wildly from classical compositions to soul, R&B, and pop music. And I'm curious how you think about and select the music you choose when creating a new work. Yeah, you know, it can depend on, I feel like a lot of my answers are gonna be like option D, just, you know, all the above. But I think, <laughs> um, I think it can really depend on maybe what I'm going through um, work, um, around the same time that um, the quiet dance was being created um, called Live the Realist MC, which also used uh, a selection from Bill Evans. Um, and I was um, just experiencing a lot of just, um, just personal change um, and professional change. And so I think I had a certain kind of connection to his melancholy. Um, and so that connected me with, with his music at that time to create. Um, I think, uh, yeah, other works in the program, I think when I think about Nina Simone's music, it's just timeless music. Um, and I know we'll probably talk a little bit more about our Indigo, the work that uses uh, Nina's music later. But um, yeah, I think sometimes it's situational. I think sometimes it can be that thing of, you know, that question that people ask also often is, what came first, the, the music or the, choreograph or, the, or the choreography? And I think that in some cases it was the choreography and in some cases it was the music. In some cases it was the themes um, that I was exploring. I think with the last work that you'll see on the program, um, I think one thing that was really kind of amazing, interesting and crazy is that um, uh, studies, uh, studies on a farewell, that work, premiered in 2019, um, but in the fall. So <laughs> you know, the opportunity to, show, to tour it afterwards was of course kind of shut down. But more to that, we made two different versions. Um, and what we're going to, to show with your audience is kind of the, the deluxe version or the director's cut, if you will. Um, I like hearing that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and part of the reason why we, we didn't do it before um, when we premiered the, the work the first time is because we were working with live music and one of the songs uses, uh, one of the compositions uses two pianos. 
and we weren't going to be able to do that um, at that time. So um, I, you know, I think I, I think there's a I have a connection to piano. It's the first instrument that I learned to play. Um, I don't play anymore, and I was never amazing at the piano. But I think I have a wide way. I was showing my parents um, my enthusiasm for dance and movement at the same time that um, I was sharing an enthusiasm and love of music. As you had mentioned, Nina Simone, um, one piece that I'm really excited to see is our Indigo, If We Were a Love Song, which features prominently the music of Nina Simone. Um, and I'm curious, again, back to this question of what inspires the dance? Does the music come first? Does choreography come first? With this particular piece, I'm curious why you chose and what inspired you to create a new work featuring Nina Simone's music. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I'm in love with um, the power and the poetry of her music and her voice um, and her message. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I, I had a solo uh, that I choreographed to Nina Simone years ago um, in 2012 um, to Namiki Tapa, and I um, kind of kept that in the repertory. I do it at gala sometimes, um, and I, I love performing it, but... Um, I just started thinking about her music all the more um, in the pandemic um, and started thinking about making solos uh, or duet here and there for the dancers. Um, and I just kept going. I started with mm. one solo and I, I had the songs already kind of in a certain kind of order. Um, and it just, I just kept creating and creating and creating. And I thought about how much, um, how our work tends to um, evolve and be created over the years. And so much of it is, you know, me videotaping myself and then sending that to the dancers to learn things and then us working together and talking about what things we need to change. Um, and I thought if there was ever a way to be working uh, and creating dance during the pandemic, that was um, the, the way that like I already knew to do. So I thought we could continue working in that way. Um, her music that was really connecting um, with me and the representation that I want to create um, or to share with um, audiences. And finally, last question, Kyle. Um, this ICA program includes three works, as you mentioned, The Quiet Dance, Our Indigo, and Studies on a Farewell. And I think some of these pieces, maybe I'm wrong, but you haven't performed them all that frequently because of the pandemic. And so in thinking about shaping this program and these three works on the same bill. I'm curious what you hope audiences will see, experience, maybe synthesize from those three works <laughs> altogether when they see this evening of dance. You know, actually, it's interesting because I am going to be really curious to see how it all comes together. <laughs> I thought there's something about it that like, it's a, I feel like it's a certain vibe. Um, it's a very kind of mature program of sorts. Um, and so I'm interested to see how people respond to it. I think all of the works have a certain type of sentimentality to them. Um, and uh, I'd like to think a lot of humanity to them, but explored in very different ways. I think um, the first work, um, the, uh, the Quiet Dance, it's very subtle in a lot of ways. And I think what, um, ironically, there's something about, um, about um, the Quiet Dance and Studies on a Farewell that have a certain type of similarity to them in places. There's these moments and um, considerations for um, isolation at times, but a approach in very, very different ways. And I, I think when you think about, um, sorry, I'm in Brooklyn, folks. Um, so I don't know if you're hearing the um, police and the fire department, but they're, they're letting us know that they're around. <laughs> Life moves forward, right? Um, yeah, like this one. Um, yeah, I think that there there's something there where I think you're getting hope your audience can um, experience all of those things. I hope they can find those moments of joy, find those moments of um, of um, solace, and those moments of just um, just understanding and consideration. Um, yeah, but more than that, I just I hope I hope people can really dig dig this program. Um, I'm I'm really curious and excited to see how um, how it reads because um, I, I think a lot of times of like a playlist, you know, just thinking about how everything sounds together, um, knowing that these are very different 
Um, but there's something sonically that kind of connects in a way, I think texturally. Um, so I think there's a really interesting evolution over the course of the program. Well, I'm really thrilled to see it next week. Um, and I can't wait for you and the company to be here. So Kyle, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>